A friend of mine once said if Oklahoma ate Bakersfield and then shitted on the ground, you'd have Southern Illinois. To be honest, I had no bias for comparison, since life had never given me a reason to visit. I took his word on the matter. This summer, however, found me on an extended road trip through the hills, hilter to untraveled. I was on my way to Louisville Slugger Museum after leaving St. Louis, and there it was, Southern Illinois. I thought it was really quaint and charming. Rolling hills, neat little farms, and all-American silos turned the entire landscape into a vision that could have made Norman Rockwell smile. It's not at all the type of place you'd expect the most horrible kind of man to live. This isn't to say that some legend about demons or monsters has buried the lines between reality and truth sworn by elementary schoolers. John Crenshaw was a very real, very successful man who spent a lifetime accumulating the kind of wealth that makes a person correct when he thinks that he can get away with murder. See, in the middle of the 19th century, Runaway slaves weren't considered to be human. They were forgotten, and their cries of pain went unheard. Sort of. When people heard the shrieks of terror imitating from the hidden attic of John Crenshaw's rural mansion, people said that it was haunted, that ghosts lived there, that the place was too dangerous to visit. They weren't entirely wrong. The screams were real. Though whether it's haunted depends on whom you ask. It is anonymously agreed, however, that the voices of the past do not want to be forgotten. John Crenshaw died without pain for his crimes. Hickory Hill, as the mansion was known, stayed in the family until it was sold in 1913. And then the voices grew louder. People came from far beyond the borders of Equality, Illinois, to see Hickory Hill. With the attic open to the public, people were able to see the horror for what it was. It turns out that John Crenshaw had turned the attic into his personal unholy playground. Tiny cells, barely big enough to hold a human, were used to hide the victims from the world. People were chained to the wall, unable to move. The cramped quarters of the stiffly hot attic would serve as a claustrophobic nightmare during the sweathering summer months. Victims would thus be made to suffer even during intermissions between the sessions of physical torture. So tourists would shamble up the rickly, extremely narrow stairs to gawk at the horror of the attic. The ghosts of the past did not appreciate the intrusion. Visitors would complain of uneasiness, feeling of being watched. Some would even hear distant screaming and no one could spend the night. Over a hundred people attempted to stay in the attic from dusk till dawn, and every one of them failed. It was always too much to endure. Whatever they heard or saw spooked them so badly. The practice was eventually banned. There's a story that one man died after his ill-flattened attempt found him running from the house in terror. His version of the Evans will remain forever untold. What would he possibly have said if he'd been given the chance? I decided that it was worth finding out. I turned off the 64 and headed 25 miles off the beaten path towards Equality. It was flat, and there was corn. That covers the highlights of the journey. The state of Illinois now owns Hickory Hill, which added a layer of complication. It turns out that you're not supposed to violate state law. But the house was never averse to crossing lines that weren't supposed to be crossed. I left my car at a nearby spot on Hickory Hill Lane as the sun was offering its last feasible attempt of daylight. I headed towards the forbidden house with nothing but my phone and a sleeping bag. With no one officially residing at the home, it was easy enough to break in through a back window. It smelled. Thick somehow like the entire house had stopped its breath to watch the intruder make its forsaken way inside. The silence was nearly painful. Most homes were filled with the faintest background of some type of noise. The tick of a clock, the hum of a refrigerator, or the creak of settling wood are distant reminders that life is change, and change can be understood. 
It was odd and somehow wrong to hear every one of my own breaths with such clarity. The grainy shuffle of my shoes on the floor was abrasively intrusive. I sneezed and the dust of the old Victorian furniture seemed to be running away from me as it scattered. Even my sense of balance was off as I wandered through the stillness. We used sound in the most suitable of ways. The absence of it made me feel as though I was perpetually on a brink of falling on the ground. The house quickly became dim and twilight settled. I knew that I had to go deeper into the interior if I wanted to find the staircase. The fumbling through the dark seemed suddenly very unsettling. I decided to move quickly. There was supposedly a secret entrance to the house that John Crenshaw used to transport his hidden captives in the attic. I didn't believe that part, of course. Until I found it. I knew it right when I saw it. Most staircases are wide open and airy. They communicate a feeling of connection. So discovering the hidden staircase in what had appeared to be a first story closet was unnerving. It was uncomfortably narrow and had no natural light. I picked my way through the dark with slow and deliberate steps. The higher I climbed, the more sensation of nausea grew in my stomach. It was unseasonably hot. I still had trouble balancing. There was no exit from the stairs reaching the attic. I emerged into darkness. There was no windows up there, because windows make for poor secrets. I wouldn't even have realized that I've left the staircase, but for the fact that the acoustics have changed. I flicked on my phone flashlight. Oh god, the descriptions were fucking true. The attic was tiny. At least it felt that way with the partitions built into the walls. I scanned my flashlight on one cell at a time. Vertigo overwhelmed me as I realized just how horrific it would have been to be stuffed into one of these boxes indefinitely. I really, really wanted to shine my light on every cell at once. But illuminated any one meant choosing to leave the rest in the dark. I whipped the phone back and forth as fast as I could, but that only made the vertigo worse. Instead, I chose to turn off my phone and see if I could get to sleep. I unrolled the sleeping bag so that my head would be in one cell while my legs extended into another. The legends of failed overnight attempts were based on the prospect of spending the entire time in the attic. No other room would do. I figured that falling and staying asleep would be the best way to get through the night. I didn't fall asleep. Instead, I thought about how many people have died right where I was lying. I wondered if they would have been angry at what I was doing, and realized that the answer was almost certainly yes. I considered how loud the screams must have been if they were heard from outside. My ears rang from the silence. My thoughts ran freely of their own accord. Why didn't the house creak, though? Those sounds should have been present even in an abandoned home. The house creaked. Thump. 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 Went my heart. There was not much else to hear. My breathing was loud in the silence. I began to wonder if it was only my breathing. I considered holding my breath to see if the deep groans would continue without me. I decided not to hold my breath. I really didn't want to know. The creaking of the house almost certainly came from the stairs. I tried to turn over on my side, but the cells were too narrow. I stayed on my back. It was really hot in the attic. I wanted to crawl out of my sleeping bag and let the damp sweat cool off, but that would have meant a lot of noise, and that would have drawn far more attention than I was comfortable with. I stayed in the sleeping bag. The stairs now were creaking in more than one place. My head was hotter than the rest of my body, despite being the only part not trapped in the sleeping bag. My right cheek especially was sweating profoundly. The attic was creaking now too. I tried to turn over again. The restriction of the cell partition took me by surprise once more. The heat traveled down my neck. I held my breath and flinched. The breathing noises continued without my respiration. The creaking now came from the attic door. The heat on my neck nearly burned. I tried to sit up, but seemed to be chained in place. I stayed where I was and felt the onset of a panic. My breathing grew faster. A second later, the sound of another breathing sped up and tried to match my pace. The attic floor was creaking to my right side. 
and on my left side. The burning concentrated on my neck, just below my ear. I tried to grab my inflamed skin, but my arms were still tightly chained. The floor directly beneath me vibrated as it creaked, while the walls of my cell groaned. The hot place on my neck grew warm and wet. A tongue licked me, long and hard, tracing a slick, thick path from my shoulder up to my lobe, then fiddling back and forth in my right ear. My arms were released. There was no question of staying at this point. I sprang up from the floor, grabbed my phone, turned on the flashlight, and ran out of the room. I left my shoes and sleeping bag behind as I sprinted for the door. The bouncing light made things hard to see as I pumped my arms back and forth. Intermediate flashes revealed the path before me like a strobe light. I found the exit and made my way through the narrow staircase. One quick flash of the stairs below me showed that people were standing at attention on every fucking step. I didn't know if it was an illusion, and made the immediate decision to turn my light away to avoid confirmation. I spent half a second deciding whether to brave the stairs or stay in the attic. Then my lower back felt warm. I sprinted immediately down the stairs. I could feel people on the steps, even as I turned to face away from them. Warm bodies pressed tightly against me as I squeezed my way through the crowd and down the stairs. The tears started to flow when I was halfway out. I wanted so badly to sprint through, but the narrow opening forced me to gringly alight on every one of the steps. Rogue hands brushed my shoulders and hair as I passed by. I fell to the floor after finally emerging from the staircase, now entirely disoriented. The tears blurred my eyes, and for a brief moment I was sure that I would never be able to find the way out of the house. But a gentle breeze blew from the right like a beacon, so I stood up and ran towards it. I kept my eyes away from the walls as I used the dim moonlight to find my path along the floor. The tears began to flow freely as I saw an open door in front of me as the source of the breeze. I had only the vaguest recognition that no door should be open since I had broken in through the window. That did nothing to slow my advance though, as I sprinted through the exit into the breezy night air. I breathed deeply and ran out. My car seemed impossibly far away, so I pushed towards it as fast as I could. I could feel the pain in my soles of my feet much later. In the moment though, there was only the car in front of me. I slammed into my car panel and reached into my pocket. For a brief, terrifying moment, I was sure that I had left my keys in the attic. Then my fingertips closed around the cool metal, and I was washed with the greatest sense of relief that I have felt before or since. I fumbled the keys, tried to get them into the door. Goddamn 1999 Value Edition Toyota Corolla was no automatic locks. Drop the keys! Snatched him from the ground, successfully unlocking the door, then hopped inside. I was done. I turned on the car, threw it in the drive, and peeled off into the night. That's when I noticed my seat felt funny. I looked down. My sleeping bag had been waiting for me on the front seat. I was sitting on it. I nearly swerved the car off the road as I pulled it out from underneath me. I wasn't willing to stop driving or even slow down, but I managed to extract the bag while missing the tree by nearly four inches. I turned to throw the bag into the back seat. There, side by side, were my shoes, neatly waiting for me. I sobbed once, turned my face to the road, and drove into the night. The trip to Equality, Illinois, was based on the fact that I wanted to take something from Hickory Hill. I needed its secrets. I was certain that the stories were bullshit. Now here's the funny thing. I have no proof that anything happened to me while I was there. It seemed like a good idea to call the police at first, but then what would I tell them other than admitting that I had trespassed, there was nothing for them to act on, that I had gone through hell and had nothing to show for it? I just wanted to talk about it with a friend, an acquaintance, hell, a random stranger at a bar. I spent a month trying to find a way to articulate my voice without being dismissed from the outset. I spent a month failing to find a way. My voice would be unheard. And then I understood everything about the house at Hickory Hill.